Hello and once again welcome back to the Windows 7 PC Security Series. You've now reached Chapter 2 of the Moderate Security Level. If you've followed all previous chapters and implemented the recommended changes, then you've made tremendous strides in gaining a solid understanding of the threats that face you, as well as making tweaks to your configuration and user habits to stop the bad guys in their tracks. In this chapter, we're going to focus on the file system to make sure things are in order and secure at the file level. That means that we're going to be talking more about the files and the folders that you see when you run My Computer. Then we'll delve even deeper into how Windows manages security for your data. I'll run through some demonstrations to show you how to make sure your files are secure at this level. And then we'll review the concepts of backing up your data as well as your Windows operating system. Finally, I'll run through demonstrations to show you how to get it all done. So let's jump right into Chapter 2 of the Moderate Security Level. So the first thing that we're going to be talking about is the file system on your PC. I'm going to go ahead and run my computer. The file system is a general term used to describe the way any operating system, or in this case Windows 7, organizes your files on the hard drive. Every operating system has their own flavor of how they handle and secure files. There are many types of files on your Windows 7 drive, and it's important to understand what the differences are for several reasons. Often users get confused when trying to explain the differences between operating system files, program files, and their own data files. These types of files are very different, they come from different sources, and they certainly have very different implications if, for instance, they're changed or deleted. Also, it's important to keep in mind where the files are located so they can easily be found later. We'll touch on that a little bit more in a minute. The first type I want to talk about are the Windows Operating System files. These Windows files include everything that make up the Windows Operating System on your PC. They got there either from the original Windows installation or after through Windows updates. These files provide all of the functionality that you use as a Windows 7 user and should not be touched. In most cases, the Windows Operating System files are located on your drive letter C, but could differ for a small number of users in some special cases. By default, these files are hidden from view, so you may not see them using your My Computer file listing. I'll modify the file option so that we can take a look. I'm going to go over here to Organize, Folder and Search Options, View tab, and we're going to scroll down and say that we want to show hidden files. We don't want to hide empty drives, extensions, or protected files. And I say yes, and apply the changes. And you notice that we see a lot of files that we didn't see before with the security turned on. The primary directories that you will see on your drive C that contain Windows operating system files are Recycle Bin, the Boot Directory, Documents and Settings, Perf Logs, Program Files, Program Files x86 if you're running the 64-bit Windows installation, Program Data, Recovery, System Volume Information, Users, and Windows, as well as possibly others. There are many files in this Drive C root directory that are placed there by Windows as well. I strongly recommend leaving the folder options at their default settings so these files and directories don't normally appear, which is much safer. You should never touch any of these files in any way. Now that we've seen what the Windows operating system directories look like, I'll go ahead and set the view settings back to the default condition. I'll go to Organize, Folder and Search Options, the View tab, and then I'll go ahead and enable those hidden files. Apply, and I'll say OK. Now you see the directory listing is back to normal. The next file that we'll look at are program files that are installed on your PC whenever you install a new application. These two are located on your drive C, which is usually the default when installing programs. Program files will install in the program files or program files x86 and program data directories, with occasional files also going into the user directory area. When looking into these directories, you'll see the subdirectories with the names of the programs that you've installed on your system. These directories contain the files needed for them to run properly and also should not be touched. I'll go ahead and open Program Files, and you'll see here a list of directories associated with the applications that are installed on this system. Yours will differ depending on what applications you have installed. 
Okay, so I'll head back up to one directory above where we started. Finally, let's talk about your data files. Although this seems simple, it can get confusing, in part because of the way Windows handles your personal data. Data refers to any file stored on your PC that's created by you or by your applications when you customize them. They could be Word documents, Excel spreadsheets, Quicken data files, photos, videos, or any other type of personal information that you've saved. In most cases, when you save a file onto your hard drive, you'll be prompted to choose a location and a file name for your file. Here's where it gets a bit complicated for many users. Windows by default will save some user data files under the directory called Users on Drive C, sometimes without asking you first. I guess the reason was to make things simpler so user could just click Save. But in the end, time and time I see PC users struggle to locate their files later after they've been saved. So I'll go ahead and I'll open up the Users directory and you'll see subdirectories for each of the named users that are created on this PC. So as I mentioned, that some files may be saved in these directories based on the currently logged in user. For example, if your username is John, there may be a directory called C Users John where Windows and some other applications may save some of your personal data files. If you open one of these user directories, you'll see a list of further directories created by Windows and other applications for your personal settings and information. The confusing part for many is that you will see, for example, directories like My Documents, My Pictures, and My Videos that you did not create that were placed there automatically by Windows or other applications. So in effect, the Windows operating system and other applications that are installed on your PC created these areas to save information for you. You need to be aware that they're here so that you know where to find files that are there already saved and so that you can include them in future data backups. I think the point that I'm trying to make starts to become obvious and probably at some time in the past you've experienced trouble trying to locate files that you know that you'd saved. The reason that I'm focusing on this is primarily to make sure that you know what to include when creating a backup copy of your data for safekeeping. Maybe you do copy or backup your data files already. If so, do you include the files in this user's directory? Or do you back up the entire drive C just to be sure? How do you know that what your backup program is copying includes everything that you have saved on your PC so that you know that you're safe? If you do back up the entire drive C just to be sure, then your backups become huge just because you're trying to back up everything to get your data files. These are typical issues that face users when attempting to parse out what makes up your data files and what belongs to Windows. As a consultant over the years, I've seen this problem create confusion and lead to the loss of important user data files many times. People believe that their data is backed up to find out that some important files and directories weren't included in their backups. Most consumer backup products will claim that they're, quote, intelligent and back up all your important information automatically. Don't believe this for a second. These backup programs will use certain assumptions and back up what they find on your hard drive based on these assumptions and I've seen them miss important data time and time again. In addition to the frustration of trying to find a file, this is a very important component of the overall security model. Remember at the beginning of the series when I covered the recovery process and how things may impact you when problems occur. Eventually your PC hardware will fail. The hard drive is the most likely part of the PC to fail because it's full of moving parts. And when it does, you may have to reinstall Windows and your applications as well as recover all your personal data. Without a solid and reliable way to know that your personal data files are backed up and safe, you will almost certainly suffer data loss. So this section and the remedies I'm going to cover are directly related to the stability and safety of your important data. The best solution to resolve most of this confusion and to ensure that you can always locate, secure, and properly back up all the personal information stored on your PC is to create a special area for all of your important data files. This can easily be done by simply creating a new directory tree structure on your drive C, specifically and only for your personal data. Only your documents, photos, videos, and other important files should be saved on these locations. Since there are probably multiple people that use your PC, you should plan for that up front and create these directories accordingly. Here's a solid and reliable recommendation for this kind of solution. So back to my computer and starting at the top level directory which is showing now, 
Let's click the New Folder link and create a new directory called Data. New folder, and we'll call it Data. Under Data, you would create other new subdirectories for each account user using the New Folder link. For instance, directory for John, and a directory for Mary. Under each of these user account directories, you will create further subdirectories for each major type of file that this user may store in his or her data area. So I'll open up John, create a new folder called Documents, another new folder called Photos, and maybe a third called Quicken Data. Okay, moving up one directory. And we will repeat this for all the user directories that we've created for the users on this PC. Now that we have a structured and simple directory structure on our drive C for all your personal data, you'll need to carefully move personal files that you've saved in other locations to these new locations. Photos to your personal John Photos directory, documents to your respective users' documents directories, and so on. Of course, you should use care and take precautions when making these changes. To begin with, make sure that you use a copy function to copy data from the old to the new locations and not a move function. A move means that the original is deleted after the copy completes. You should right mouse click and select the copy option to copy files, leaving the originals in place until you've tested each application and you're confident that all is working with your data before you delete the old files. So at this point, we've created a new area for your personal data and move files to these new locations. Next, you need to make sure that the programs that you're running on your PC also will save the data to these new locations. I'll open up the John directory where we created subdirectories for your different file types for this example. So you should go ahead and launch each of your installed programs and click around in the File or the Save menu areas to locate where these programs are saving your important data. In most cases, applications will have a Preferences or Options choice where you can configure them to save all your new files to this new area by default. The point is, you now have a new area on your Drive C for your data files, so you need to try and get all of your applications to automatically save all of your important things there in the future. Probably one of the most important types of information stored on your PC is your email, calendar, and contacts information. You may want to include moving your email files to these new directory locations as part of this new configuration. Just create a new subdirectory under each user's area for email. Remember to close out all of your email programs so the files won't be in use before you start the copy, and then copy them to the new data area. Typically, Microsoft Office will store the Outlook email files in the C backslash users backslash your username that would be replaced with whatever your login username is backslash app data backslash local backslash Microsoft backslash Outlook directory. Then after copying the files, you need to run Outlook and configure for the new location. I'll take a minute or two here and show you how to make this change using Microsoft Outlook 2007. Of course, each version may differ a bit, but this will give you an idea of what needs to be done to relocate your mail files for Outlook. So launching Outlook, here you see a basic view of the main Outlook email screen. I'm going to click on File, then from the drop-down menu, I'm going to select Data File Management. From here, I'll click the Add button. After making sure that what's highlighted is Office Outlook Personal Folder Type, I'll click OK. Then using this screen, we'll navigate to the new C Data area where you just copied your Outlook files to for this user, and click OK. And then finally, we have an opportunity to give that email file a name or title, which is what will show up on the left window pane of your Outlook mail listing. Then click OK. Now you'll probably see both the old and new email files listed on the left window pane of the Outlook main screen. You can right mouse click at the top of the listing for your old file and close it. Then once you've tested email to make sure that it's all working, you can delete the old email file from the C users location that I mentioned just a minute ago. Now Outlook will automatically use this new location for all email activities. So that about covers the concepts surrounding types of data on your PC. 
from Windows operating systems files to your own personal files, as well as discussing a method to simplify your data locations for future use and backup purposes. Even with these new data directories in place, some Windows files will still be saved to the C users area, so we still need to include that users directory when backing up your personal data. I'll cover the actual backup and recovery a bit later in this chapter. I'm going to go ahead and close out my computer. Now I want to talk about how Windows secures all files on the hard drive and what this security means to you. Windows 7 uses the NTFS file system. NTFS stands for New Technology File System. In short, NTFS is a set of rules that Windows uses when it saves data to your hard disk and other storage devices. It provides all of the capability to secure your data. Windows 7 still supports the older and far less secure FAT32 or FAT file systems. What that means is that it's possible to have a second disk drive or an external storage device such as a USB connected flash drive that's running one of these older file systems that won't have the file security of an NTFS drive. You can easily check any storage installed or attached to your PC to see which file system it's using with the My Computer tool. Of course, I'm assuming that you're logged in as computer administrator to see these options. So to check which type of file system that your drives and other storage devices are using, I'm going to go ahead and click Start. My Computer. And then I can right mouse click on any of your disks and check Properties. And you see here it will show you what the file system type is for that particular drive. If you do find that some of the drives connected to your PC are still using the FAT or FAT32 file system, I highly recommend that you convert them to the NTFS file system as soon as possible. This can be done using the convert command from the command line that I'll demonstrate right now. I'm going to go ahead and close this out. Come over to the start button. In the search field I'm going to type CMD run up here and click on CMD which is the command line processor and then on the command line we're going to type convert D colon slash FS NTFS alright so in this example what I'm asking Windows to do is convert a drive letter D to the NTFS file system using the convert command this assumes that you have a D drive on your computer and that you've checked its file system and found it not to be NTFS, either FAT or FAT32. This command may take a while to run and it's critical that you allow it to run interrupted. Also, you may get a message that tells you that you have to reboot your PC to continue. If so, you should reboot immediately and allow the conversion to complete. But again, drive D is just what I'm using in my example. You may have found that you have another drive or storage device that's another drive letter like drive E F, G, whatever it may be that you have to replace in this command line. Okay, so that's just the example. I'm not going to run the command, but that's how you convert to NTFS. I'm going to go ahead and close that. I'm going to close out my computer. Okay, so you should now have all the drives running under the NTFS file system for maximum security and flexibility. The next step is to demonstrate how you can view the security settings that NTFS has configured for your file system. This is simply a demonstration so that you can see the tools and screens associated with the file system security on your PC. The NTFS file system has many built-in features and can be quite complex for most PC users to deal with. I strongly recommend that you leave NTFS settings as is unless you have a specific requirement to block access to a particular file or directory on your hard drive. And I'll demonstrate that example for blocking access in just a minute. Security for your file system can be viewed or changed using the My Computer tool. Okay, let's take a look. We're going to go to Start, Computer. I'm going to navigate to the Users directory. Do a right mouse click and select Properties. This brings us to the C Drive Users Directory Properties screen. The General tab gives us basic statistics and some other important information. I'm going to go ahead and click on the Security tab, which shows us the current NTFS security that's applied to this user's directory. 
you'll see a list of the groups and users who have access to this directory, as well as which permissions they're allowed. If you click on different users or groups, you can see how the permissions change. Right now I've selected everyone. These are the permissions. I can look at system permissions, administrators, and finally users. You'll also notice that there is an edit button and an advanced button, which gives you many additional options for making changes to the security profile for this directory. We'll make no changes here, of course, because C drive users is one of the Windows 7 operating system directories that should not be touched. Now that we've seen the NTFS directory permissions, let's take a look at the data directories that we just created and check security permissions there. I'm going to go ahead and cancel out. We're going to go to data, properties, and then back to security for that particular directory. Let's say our goal is to secure each user's personal data directory so that other users cannot view their files. In effect, we will lock down the file system further than it is by default to ensure privacy for each user. Of course, you need to take special care to make sure that you're working only on this newly created data directory and that you're following the instructions closely on this demonstration. It is possible that you could lock yourself out of a directory by securing things too much. There is a way to get out of that situation, which I'll cover in a bit. If you're not too concerned about others having access to your sensitive files, then you may choose to leave security unchanged. If you leave files unprotected, then remember that others can see your information and could by accident corrupt or delete important files. So leaving them open for all to see will cause the probability of a failure or problem to rise significantly in the future. Even if you choose not to implement these security steps, you should still follow the demonstration to better understand how it all works. All right, so I'm going to work with user John and lock down John's directory for purposes of this demonstration. I'm going to go ahead and cancel out of here. And then under data, remember we created the John directory, right? So I'm going to go right mouse click and properties for the John directory and then look at his security. Okay, so we're looking at the default permissions for the John user directory. Remember that all directories are part of a larger tree with directories above and below. If no special security is inherently applied to any specific directory, Windows will assume that security comes from the directory above. These are called inherited permissions. To set implicit security specifically to a directory like John's, first you must turn off these inherited permissions coming from above. So to do that, I'm going to first click on Advanced, then Change Permissions. And remember, we're doing this all for the C Data John directory. So now you'll see a checkbox next to include inheritable permissions from this object's parent. I'm going to go ahead and uncheck that. When we do, we get a choice to add, remove, or continue. You should choose add so that Windows adds the inherited permissions from above directly to this John directory, which means that this John directory will no longer depend on the permissions from above. We will implicitly assign those permissions to this directory. I'm going to go ahead and say add. Some of this may seem a little bit complex, but in the future, just follow these instructions for all of your user directories and everything will work out just fine. Now let me go back to the permission screen. Now we can add or remove specific users that we want to have access to John's directory, as well as setting which permissions each user can have. First, let's add users that need access. It's always a good idea to add users that you want to have access first and configure their permissions before deleting any users or groups. That way you know who is allowed to access before you remove access from anyone. For this example, we'll say that John needs full access and Mary needs to be able to just see the files, but can make no changes to anything located in that directory. Now you could lock other users completely out depending on which permissions you allow. That's a choice that you can make at the time that you assign permissions. I'm going to go ahead and click edit, which is going to let me edit the group and usernames. The add button then the advanced button, then I'm going to say find now to list all the users on this machine. And I'll open up this field a little bit so we can see what the names are and scroll down and look for Mary and John. All right, so I have John and Mary. I'm going to select both of them. I'm going to say okay 
then OK again. And you can see now that Mary and John have been added to the group or usernames list. So I'm going to go ahead and highlight John to look at the permission specifically for the user John for the C data John directory. I'm going to go ahead and give John full control of this directory. Then I'm going to click on Mary and look at her permissions. Okay, so we'll go down to the permissions box for Mary and see what we have by default. By default, we have read and execute, list folder contents, and the read attribute. But I'm going to start back at the top of these attributes and describe what each one means in general. Full control, that's pretty self-explanatory. We gave that to John for this directory. Full control means that you can do everything you want. You have full control of this directory. Modify means that you can just make changes to the files in that directory. So you could rename a file or you could make changes to a file and resave it under that same name. Read and execute means you can see the file and its attributes and you could run it if it was a program. So if Quicken was loaded there, you could execute Quicken and run it from that directory. List folder contents, again, pretty self-explanatory. It means that a user can list the files and the folders in this directory. Then you have read. Read by itself means that you can just see the file or you could see the attributes of the file, but you can't make any changes to the file or the directory. I'm going to scroll down and see what else we have. And we have the write attribute. Write means that you can write to that directory. You could create a new file or write new changes to an existing file in this directory. Then you see special permissions. Special permissions is grayed out. What that is, is there are advanced permissions that you can set on any directory or any file using NTFS. This is generally for IT professionals or administrators, and I'd suggest that you don't get bogged down on all of the different options in the special permissions area. They can get quite complex. But if you did make changes and you got very granular in terms of your rights for this particular directory, you would see the special permissions box would be checked by default. All right, so back up to Mary. What we're going to let Mary do is we're going to let her list the folder contents, and we're going to let her see the files that are there. I'll go ahead and take read and execute away. So she won't be able to execute programs if they exist in John's directory, and she won't be able to write any new data, make changes, or create any new files in that directory. That pretty much accomplishes the security goal that we were looking for, that only John has full control over this directory, and other users like Mary can just see the files but can't delete or make changes to them or cause any other problems that would hurt John's data. Now that we've added the necessary permissions for John and Mary, we can go ahead and delete the other accounts that we see listed here that we don't want to have access to this directory. Okay, at the top of the list we see authenticated users. That's a group designated by the two heads in the little icon here. It's a group of users, meaning that all users that authenticate onto this system, regardless of their rights, will have access, defined here below in the permissions box, to this directory. That somewhat defeats the purpose, right? Because we want just Mary and John to have different rights to this directory, not everybody that logs into the system. So I'm going to go ahead and select Authenticated Users, and I'm going to remove them from this rights list. And looking at the top, we see the System Group. This is created by the Windows Operating System, and you should never delete it from your File Properties list. This gives Windows the authority to do things that it needs to do to manage the operating system on your hard drive. Then we see Mary and John, which we created and we added rights to. Then we see Administrators Group. The Administrators Group means that everybody who has an account on this system that's an administrator equivalent could see this directory based on the rights, and you see their full control below in the permissions list. That defeats the purpose as well of what we're trying to do. Now remember that in earlier chapters when we created users on this PC, we said that we only want one administrator equivalent account on this PC to manage the PC. All other users should be standard users. So if that's the case, this group should only contain one user. In this example, it would be John. John is the administrator. To be safe, you should delete the administrator's group from this permissions list because any account on this system that has an administrator equivalence would also have access to this directory. Remember, our purpose here is to lock everybody out but John and Mary. I'm going to go ahead and delete administrators. Now we have users. Users means that there's any user account on this PC, it'll have the right specified below. I'm going to go ahead and delete users. That again gets around what we're trying to do with John and Mary. So what we have here as a result is the system so that Windows can do what it needs to do to the C data John directory. And then we see Mary and John, Mary having restricted rights and John having full rights to this directory. Now depending on the applications that you have installed on your PC, 
you may see other special application accounts listed here that were created by those applications. For example, Norton Utilities might be installed on a PC and it might create an account called Norton. Norton might have access to all the files and folders on your PC so that it can do the things that it needs to do for its backups and its security processes. So in general, any account that's created by applications that you've installed on your PC shouldn't be removed from these account lists. You then repeat this for every user directory under C data that you've created to give full rights to those that own the directory and some restricted rights for everyone else depending on how you want to secure each one of those high level directories. Once completed, this is a solid first step towards securing your data and other important information from misuse or accidental deletion. Be aware of what these security changes really mean. If you lock a directory down so that only you can see it, it means that you must be logged in as you to get to the files located there. So for example, if you use Quicken and you've saved Quicken files into your particular protected area, but the PC is logged in as a different user, if you were to run Quicken, Quicken would not be able to access those files that are already stored there until you log out and log back in as yourself. All right, so now that we've made all the permissions changes to the C data John directory, I'm going to go ahead and click OK, then OK again, and get back to the My Computer screen. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to log out, and then I'm going to log back in as user Mary. Then I'll attempt to view the user John's personal directory that we just locked down to see what the results are. I'll go ahead and hit pause now for a second while I log in as Mary. Okay, I'm back and I'm logged in. I'll go ahead and click the start button. You'll see I'm logged in as user Mary. I'll go ahead and run my computer. Then go to my C drive. Then my data directory. And here we have the John directory where we modified the permissions a moment ago. I'm going to go ahead and go into the John directory. I'll go further into the documents directory for John. And you see some of the files that are created that I put there. I'll go ahead and open up John file number one. You see it allows me to open up the file. But if I make a change to it and I try to save that file, it pops up and says, hey, what do you want to call the file? It gives me the save as option because it won't let me save it under the current file name. If I type in another file name and I click Save, I get an error. I don't have the rights to save a file in this directory. That's exactly what we'd expect because we locked Mary out from having the ability to delete or create files in this directory. I'll say no and I'll go ahead and cancel out. So I think that accomplishes what we're trying to do, right? We're trying to give the primary user full rights and then every other user limited rights to a directory. Now for instance, I'll back up to the John directory. Now, if you wanted to make sure that other users other than John had no access to the John directory, then you would simply remove all of the permissions attributes from that user or remove the user entirely. Right? So if I just removed Mary from this list, Mary would have no rights to this directory and wouldn't see it at all. So it depends on how locked out and secure you want each directory for each user to be. I'm going to go ahead and cancel and close that out. If you find for some reason that you've locked yourself out of one of these new directories, even when you're logged in as the appropriate user, there is a way to restore access. The first thing you need to do is log into Windows with an account that has administrator rights. For my example, that would be John. So I'm going to do the pause thing again and come right back after I log back in. See you in a second. First, we need to get back to the permission screen for that locked out directory. So now I'm going to go to the start button, then computer, open up my C drive, go to the data directory, and then right mouse click on John, do properties, and finally the security tab. From the security tab, we're going to go down and click the advanced button. Then we're going to go to the owner tab. The Owner tab within the Security Permissions dialog box allows us to control who is the owner to the object listed below, which is C Data John. The owner has full rights to do what they need to do with the directory. So if you get locked out, you come here to change the owner to yourself, and now you have access to your directory again. So now we're going to move down, we're going to click the Edit button to edit this Change Owner list. We see now that we have two options, Administrators or John. I'm going to select John. 
John will become the new owner of this directory and all of its contents. I'm going to go ahead and say replace owner on subcontainers and objects. And then I'll go ahead and say apply. I'm not going to do it now because we're not locked out, but that's how you would gain access if you lost access because you locked things down too far. I'm going to click cancel, cancel again, and then again. Once you've gone through this process after a lockout and you've reassigned the ownership like we just did, you may want to go back to the demo that we covered for locking that directory down and relock it down and make sure all the users have the rights that you intend. The second time you lock that directory structure down, pay close attention to the usernames that have access and which permissions you're granting, always making sure that someone has full access, which should be the owner of that directory. But there has to be a reason that you locked yourself out, so it has to be one of those checkboxes that got missed. So now we've covered the NTFS file system and followed with an exercise to lock down and secure your personal data from other users on this PC. What's important to know is that NTFS is the file system security used for Windows 7 and that all directories and files stored on your hard drive are managed using these rules. As a standard practice, you should not regularly use NTFS settings or make changes elsewhere unless you have strong experience with these tools. And you should never make changes to the NTFS security settings at the root C drive level or any Windows or application created directories or files. It's important to remember from previous explanations that this NTFS security only applies to a normally operating PC. Remember, if your PC was stolen or someone removes the hard disk from the system, they can easily circumvent Windows security regardless of how you configure NTFS. I'll be covering how to protect your data from this or any other situation in the advanced level of this system. Next, we need to cover backup and recovery of your important data in your Windows operating system. Most users do not give nearly enough credence to the safe and frequent backup of their data or how they will recover it if data loss occurs. The more you leverage your PC in today's world of electronic everything, the more you need to back up aggressively. There are many products on the market sold as backup and recovery safeguards that can automatically perform backups and recover your data when failure occurs. Beware of this automatic sales pitch. Sure, they back up your data, but they don't know where all of your important files are and can't guess what you may want to do with them when you need to recover. There are a variety of products out there and how they work goes well beyond the scope of this system. But what I'm going to do is explain the types of backups that should be important to you to meet the standards that we set at the beginning of this system for easy recovery, no matter what situation you run into, and then how to get them done regardless of what product you use. Windows 7 does have built-in backup tools, and I'll demonstrate them now as part of this section. As we move through these backup discussions and demonstrations, it will become clearer and clearer why separating your personal data from the Windows operating system files was so important. Making security simpler for your personal information was just one of the many reasons that it makes sense to keep all of your data in one area. It also greatly simplifies your backup and recovery procedures as well. So you know that you need to back up several types of data to be secure and ready to recover in the event of a failure. Now you need to consider where you will place all of this backup data. The very best option is to purchase an external hard drive that connects to your PC's USB or FireWire ports. Having all of your data and personal information backed up and enjoying the peace of mind that that brings with it means making a small additional investment in hardware. I highly recommend that you purchase an external hard disk for backup purposes that's at least the same size of your internal PC's drive C. Using an external drive is simple and much faster than using a network drive or DVDs or CDs. It's also more reliable. Backup procedures and hardware ensure that you have copies of your important information on hand for most situations, but not for all situations. To really be sure that you're able to recover from all situations, Best practice for serious PC owners states that you should purchase two separate external hard drives for backups. Why? For a number of reasons. One is the possibility that your external backup drive fails, and of course that'll be right after your PC crashes and you need it to recover. Another is theft or worse. The typical user will store his PC in the same area as their external backup drive. What if your equipment is stolen and the thieves take the backup drive as well as your PC? What if you lose your home in some type of fire or storm? The best way to be fully protected is to own two external backup drives, a primary and a secondary. Store the primary drive in a safe place at the location where your PCs are located, and store the other at a trusted off-site location. Then at regular intervals, retrieve the off-site drive and copy all the files from your primary to the secondary drive, and then return it off-site. 
This ensures that you will always have your information available no matter what happens at home or your small office. As always, keep in mind that an external disk drive can be viewed by anyone who gets their hands on it. Remember that the security and passwords that are used by Windows only apply if the drive is installed in your normal PC under normal conditions. So these external backup drives must be stored in a secure location such as a safe. If you decide that you can only purchase one external drive, all the rules still apply here. You just won't have an off-site copy for that additional protection. Now let's jump into specific types of backup and recovery tools that are included in Windows 7. Let's talk about personal data file backups. Since backing up your personal data files is the thing that you're the most familiar with, we'll cover it first. This type of backup will make a copy of your personal files using a backup tool such as Windows Backup. There are many products on the market that help users like you backup and recover their files. But since Windows 7 comes with a backup tool built in, it isn't necessary to spend money on another product. This backup involves selecting the areas on your hard disk that you want to include in your backup, then telling the backup tool where you want to save that backup, and then setting a reoccurring schedule for future backups. This is not a snapshot or image of your entire drive C like the system image is. It's a backup of individual files for selective recovery at a later time. For example, if you backup your files on Sunday, and then you delete a Word file on Monday morning, you could go back to Sunday's version of that backup and restore just that one Word file from Sunday. Any changes that you made on Monday wouldn't be included on that Sunday backup recovered file. If you don't perform regular data file backups, then you risk loss of your work if you or another user on your PC accidentally deletes a file, if your hard drive crashes, or if your PC is stolen. In all of these cases, you could lose your work, your photos, your records, and your data from the time of the failure back to when you last backed it up. You may think that you could tolerate having files that are one, two, maybe three weeks old in the event of a failure, but I can tell you for certain that you'll have big problems with many files that are two or three weeks old. Important and time-sensitive information such as banking, finance, and other date-sensitive files will be very problematic if more than a day or two out of date. All of the backups that we are covering are important to ensure that you have a turnkey method in place to address any type of failure or scenario. But if you don't have your latest data files available, even a clean Windows recovery won't help you very much. As I move forward to demonstrate the Windows backup process, I'm assuming that you only have a drive C to back up in your computer, and that you've purchased some type of external storage device which should be connected before we proceed. If you do have other drives in addition to Drive C on your PC with personal data stored on them, that's not a problem. You'll just need to include those areas as well when we get to the section where we select the files to be included in your backup. Windows Backup works best on backup schedules that you create using its scheduling tools. So for this demo, we will in effect be creating a reoccurring backup schedule for our data files. Okay, so let's go ahead and launch Windows Backup. Start. We're going to go to Control Panel, then System and Security, and then finally we're going to look for Backup and Restore. Okay, so this is the main backup option screen. You can see under the backup header that we haven't done any backups or any schedules yet because this is right out of the box. That's what we're going to do today. I'm going to go over and I'm going to say Set Up Backup. That starts up the Windows Backup tool. Okay, so this is the main starting window for the Windows Backup tool. You notice that it lists two possible backup destinations, my DVD drive and my backup drive, which is the external disk drive that we talked about. I'm going to go ahead and back up to my external hard drive. I named it Backup Drive 1. It happens to be Drive E. I'm going to go down and click Next. Now Windows is asking us what we want to back up. There's two options. The automatic option we've talked about, which lets Windows choose what we're going to back up. I'm not a real fan of that. I want to choose and select the specific directories that I know contain my data. I'm going to say let me choose and then click Next. And now we see the Windows backup drive listing based on what it found on our hard disks. Okay, starting at the top, we see some data files that Windows identified. We're going to leave them all selected. So we want to back up data for newly created users, and we want to go ahead and back up the libraries as well. They're selected for all of the users on the system. Now I'm going to drop down the C drive, 
and take a look at what we want to back up. Remember, we're not backing up system information. We're not backing up program files. But this is a backup for our user data. So I'm going to select the directory that we created specifically to hold all of our user data. And then I'm going to collect the user's directory because there still could be some data that certain applications in Windows saving there related to each of the users on this machine. So now you should have all the areas that contain personal information that we've saved on our drive C included. You should uncheck all other directories so that you don't back up information unnecessarily. You should also uncheck the box next to include a system image of your drive C. I'm going to go ahead and uncheck that now. I don't want to include that in my typical user data backup. If I enable this checkbox, it would include a drive image backup that's not a regular part of my data file backups. It's too large and doesn't need to be run as often as data file backups do. I'll cover the system image backup in just a bit. All right, so now I'm going to click Next. Okay, so this is our backup settings screen. Let's review what it tells us. By default, it will select a weekly backup in time. Let's click the Change Schedule option to make changes to this schedule. Now we can set our own schedule based on our own needs. You'll see the checkbox next to Run Backup on a Schedule. I'm going to go ahead and make sure that that's enabled. Once checked, the schedule that we're about to create will be saved, and Windows will remind you through the Action Center when the schedule comes due. If you uncheck this box, then you'll have to manually remember when to run these backups. I strongly recommend that you leave this option checked so that Windows will remind you on a regular schedule. Now you have some drop-down boxes for setting how often and on what days and times you want to run this backup. Here's my recommendation and the reasons for them. Since the only options are weekly and daily, I recommend that you select weekly. This is because if you select daily, you'll very likely leave your external USB drive connected all the time, which in effect defeats the NTFS security of your data files because as I've mentioned previously, a drive that's not installed on your PC could be viewed by anyone who attaches it to another PC. For this reason only, I would select weekly at a time and day that's convenient for you to take a few minutes needed to plug in your drive and run the backups. Keep in mind that when you are reminded, you need to take the time to do the backups or you'll begin to slide back into an unprotected state. Now you'll have a weekly reminder, which will show up in the Windows Action Center icon at the bottom of the screen. But remember, the best practices state that you should backup more than just weekly. So my recommendation is that you run this backup two to three times per week manually. Although the weekly schedule will be set, you could still run this job manually anytime you like. So now assuming that how often, what day, and what time is acceptable for you to run these backups when you're reminded, I'm going to go ahead and click OK on the schedule. All right, so we see what we're doing is we're backing up the all users directory, C data, and C users. So this should encompass all of the user data files that we've created and stored on our PC. I'm going to go ahead and click Save Settings and Run Backup. So on the screen, we see what our target location is and what our backup schedule information might be. I'm going to go ahead and put us on pause now and come back when the backup is complete. Okay, so now I'm going to bring back up the Windows backup screen. And now we're going to take a look at what we would need to do to run a manual backup. Again, this is going to be scheduled to trigger a backup every week, and it's going to remind you at the Action Center down here at the bottom of the screen when that backup is ready to go. But if you want to back up more often, which is highly recommended, you would still just come back to the same tool and then click the Backup Now button. That would create another manual backup and add it to the same external hard drive. I would recommend you do this at least two to three times per week, or if you ever do some large amount of work where you've done some important changes to your data and you'd like to back up afterwards to be safe. Okay, so now we have our backup scheduled and configured, and we ran our first backup to our external disk drive for safekeeping. So if you delete a file, or maybe you want to recover an older version of a file from what's on your disk drive from the backup disk, then you need to plug in that external backup drive and get ready for a restore running the Windows backup product. I'm already there right now, and the screen will look just like this if you come back to it in the future, but I'll go ahead and click the Restore My Files button. Once I do, it's going to create a list of files that I want to restore. So I'm going to say Browse for Files. And then you notice that it's found the files that are on my external drive that we backed up. So I'm going to go ahead and click on Backup of Drive C. 
open that folder, and then here's the two directories that we backed up, the data directory and the users directory. So I'm going to open up data, then John, then his documents. And let's say that John's file one is the file that we either deleted or corrupted, and it's the one we need to restore. Again, remember, we're not looking on our drive C at our live data. We're looking at the backup that was previously done on our external disk drive. All right, I'm going to say add files. What that means is going to add it to this list. So the purpose here is to add all the files that you need to recover during this process. All right, I'm just going to recover that one file. I'm going to go ahead and say next. Now it wants to know whether I want to recover it to the original location or I want to select a new location. All right, so if I say in the original location, which is the default, then that file will overwrite the one that's already on my C drive right now. That may be okay with you. Maybe the file's no good and you need the restored file there. There may be occasions when you want to have both files so you can compare them and see which one is the one you want to keep. If that's the case, you'd say in the following location. And I'll tell you, that's the safest thing to do. Almost always when I do restores, I'll say in the following location and not overwrite the originals yet. Later on, I can copy it to the original location if I decide that the file is the one that I really want. I'm going to go ahead and say browse. I'm going to go to my C drive. I have a directory called restored files. I'll select that and I'll say OK. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to restore that one file selected off of my external backup to my C restored files directory. I'll go ahead and say restore now and it's done. I'll click finish. So let's go over to my computer and see what we got. My computer. I'll go to drive C. I'll go to the restored files directory and there's John's file one, right? So that was originally located under data, John, and documents. So now I have both of them. I can decide which is the one that I need to keep and then copy them accordingly, right? So that's a successful restore from our backup. So that's about it for backing up your personal data files. Okay, so let's move on to the next section in our backup and recovery demonstration and talk about the Windows 7 System Repair Disk. The System Repair Disk is a very useful tool that can be used to help you recover Windows operating system components in case you have a major problem. There are rare occasions when a corrupt file or other problems can affect Windows so that it will not start up or fails to operate properly. Windows 7 provides a way to create a recovery CD or DVD that you can use to start your system up. This disk contains several utilities that will help you repair problems within your Windows 7 installation. Even if Windows does start up, you can use this tool to guide you through several recovery steps to resolve other problems with your Windows 7 installation. The Windows System Repair Disk tools can also be found by hitting the F8 key when you start your computer. If you hit the F8 key before the Windows or other logo pops up during the startup, Windows will bring up the same system repair menu found on the repair disk. This assumes that you can start up and get to this point and that Windows is not too far gone to get to this feature. Now let's run through the steps of creating a new system repair disk. Okay, let's go to the start button. We'll go to control panel, system and security, backup and restore, and now we'll look on the left window pane for Create System Repair Disk. As I mentioned, you can use this System Restore CD to boot up your Windows PC even if it won't start on its own. Even if it does start and you're having major problems, you can still boot up on this repair disk to access all the repair utilities provided. I'll cover Restore and Recovery options using the System Repair Disk at the end of this section. All right, so you would insert a blank CD or DVD in the drive listed and then click Create Disk. I'm not going to run it now because I've already created a repair disk for this system. Once it's complete, just make sure you label it appropriately and store it safely. I'm going to go ahead and say Cancel. So that's all there really is to it, to creating that system repair disk. All right, I'm going to move on now to something called Startup Repair. The first tool that will be listed on your recovery options when you use this boot up CD or the F8 recovery tool process is called startup repair. Sometimes very simple files located on your drive C can get corrupted or deleted that are needed for Windows to start up properly. This tool repairs those files which should return Windows to a startable state. This process is simple and involves little risk. 
It would be one of the first things that you try to do if you're getting error messages on the screen when you start up your PC and Windows will not start up. Again, you can get to this by booting off of your system recovery disk or choosing the F8 recovery tool option when your machine starts. The next thing we want to cover is System Restore. The System Restore is a feature built into Windows 7 where you can restore certain critical Windows operating system files from what's known as the last working set or restore point. The purpose of a System Restore is to provide a tool to recover if you delete or corrupt certain Windows system files accidentally or if a new program installation corrupts or damages them. When most Windows programs are installed, they automatically create what's called a restore point before making changes to your system. This restore point contains a point in time copy of those files which it stores on your drive C for later recovery if needed. You can also manually create a restore point at any time if you're about to make changes to your system and want to be able to roll back to the previous settings. Rolling back to a previous restore point makes considerable changes to your system and should only be used if you're experiencing serious problems. Right now, let's look at how we get to the system protection and recovery tools. All right, back to my computer. Properties. And then we want to look at system protection on the left window pane. Okay. So here you see the tools needed for creating, managing, and restoring your restore points. First, notice the list box under Protection Settings. You'll need to make sure that your Windows Operating System Drive, which is almost always Drive C, is listed here and shows that its protection is set to On. If it's set to Off, then you'll need to click the Configure button and turn it on for that drive letter. By default, it should be set to On. Alright, so we're going to click the System Restore button and then Next to Continue. Now we'll see a list of all previously saved restore points and their date and time stamps and descriptions. You would rely on the system restore in the event that you encounter serious Windows errors or problems with functionality immediately after installing new software, doing an upgrade, or making changes to your operating system. Before running a system restore, you should run antivirus and anti-spyware scans using the installed tools to make sure that the problems that you're having are not malware related. Also, Windows System Restore will not fix simple configuration or settings issues. It's designed to roll back many critical operating system files to the last known set stored on your PC, known as the Restore Point. Remember that rollback means just that, a rollback to an earlier time. So if you have installed programs or run updates since the last saved Restore Point, they will be affected. Windows provides a tool to check and see what will be affected when you roll back to an earlier Restore Point. You can view this information by clicking the Scan for Affected Programs button. This will display what will be deleted and what will be rolled back or replaced during this system restore. If you know exactly when your problem started, then you can pick a restore point just before that time. If not, I recommend that you select the most recent restore point from the list. Then click Next. I only have one restore point, but if you had several here, click the most recent or the known restore point before the problem occurred. Right? Then we'll click Next. Then you confirm your selections and click Finish to begin the restore. After it completes, you'll restart your system and you should now be returned to its original normal working state as of that restore point date and time. All right, I'm not going to actually roll back, but that's how it's done. You click Finish. I'll click Cancel to go back. All right, I'm going to go back to the start of the System Restore tool to demonstrate how to perform a manual restore point backup. This will be done if before you installed a new application or made significant changes to your Windows installation, you wanted to save a restore point. Remember that restore points use disk space on Drive C and that many program installations will automatically create a restore point before they run their installations. So create manual restore points only when you really believe it's needed. So I would click Create let's say restore point before installing office and I'll say create so it's going off and it's taking a snapshot of certain important system files as of now that we could roll back to if our installation of office caused a problem
All right, so my restore point was created successfully. I'll say close. Now, if I go back to the system restore function, click next, you see that two are listed. The most current one that I just did and the one that existed there previously. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and cancel out, cancel out, and close out the screen. And keep in mind that if your problem was so severe that you couldn't get to the normal Windows desktop, you could still boot up with your system recovery CD or by hitting F8 when you boot your machine and get to the system recovery tools and perform a system restore the same way. So now we're familiar with the system restore feature, how to use it, when to use it, and how to manually protect yourself by creating your own restore points if necessary. All right, let's move forward. Now we'll talk about something called a system image. Your Windows 7 operating system files work together as a group in a very interactive way. This means that we need to treat these files as one big chunk rather than individual files like you might with your own photos or documents. If you mix some Windows 7 files from a week ago with some from today, you'll likely end up with a problematic Windows 7 experience. Therefore, the best way to back up these Windows system files is to take what's called an image of the entire set. In Windows, this is called a system image. When you take an image of your operating system, you end up with a large block of files that makes up a snapshot of that point in time. Like the system restore tool that we just covered, images also reflect the point in time when taken, but include the entire operating system and programs installed, basically everything on your drive C, where the system restore only included certain core Windows files. I recommend that you only attempt a system image recovery in two scenarios. First, if you experience serious Windows failures or problems and cannot resolve them by using the other tools such as System Restore. Or second, if your Drive C hard drive has failed and you have to replace it with a new physical disk drive. In that case, you're starting with a clean drive and you have the option to recover your Windows and program installations using this system image tool rather than completely reinstalling everything from scratch. What's important to remember is that saved images are a snapshot and just like a photograph will come back with everything exactly as it was at the time it was created. All applications installed or tweaks made after the image was taken will be lost when you recover or restore an image. Even so, a far better alternative than a complete reinstall of everything. The best way to look at it is the system image recovery is your last line of defense to repair problems with your Windows installation. Okay, let's see what it takes to create a new Windows system image. Remember that the image is a snapshot or entire copy of your drive C, which will contain all of the Windows files and program files. Before we get started, we need to plug in our external backup drive, make sure there's plenty of space available on it to do this system image. All right, let's get to the system image tool. Let's do start, control panel, System and Security, Backup and Restore. And then we look over on the left window pane for Create a System Image. So Windows needs to know where you want to place these operating system image files. Remember that this backup will include everything on your drive C, so it will be quite large. If you select the Hard Drive Radio button option, then you can drop down the selection box to select which hard drive you want to use as your backup target. You should select the drive letter assigned to your external backup drive. That's already selected here. Actually, it's the only option because you can't do an image backup to your existing C drive because that's what you're imaging. The only other drive I have available is my backup drive, so it defaulted to that. If you had additional drives and you wanted to backup to them with your system image, you would select it from here. The next option is one or more DVDs. One or more DVDs will require several blank DVDs that you would insert into your DVD writer. I don't like the option because it takes a lot of DVDs and it takes quite a bit of time. Also, any one of those DVDs gets corrupted or damaged and your entire set is bad. If you're familiar with network drives and have another PC with plenty of free space available, then you could use this option instead of the external hard drive or DVD options, but I don't recommend it. Using network drives complicates things, is generally slower, and will make recovery or restoring this image more difficult in the event of emergencies. Once you've selected your external USB disk as your target for the image, we'll click Next. 
This screen simply confirms your backup selection, tells you the approximate size that will be backed up, and gives you the option to begin. I'm going to go ahead and say Start Backup. All right, so while this runs, I'm going to take a second to point out something that will be further addressed in upcoming advanced chapters. Notice that the Drive-C image is quite large. In my case, it's over 10 gigabytes of data. Remember that all of your personal data files are also located on Drive-C and therefore will be included in this image backup. Remember also that this data image can only be recovered as a block of data to restore an unusable copy of Windows. Only the Windows and program files need to be recovered for Windows to run. So every time you take an image like this or recover it, you're taking the time and disk space to copy all of your personal photos, videos, documents, and other data files as well. Files that have nothing to do with Windows running properly. I'm mentioning this now because you begin to see that it really doesn't make sense to store your personal data files on Drive C for this specific reason. We'll be talking about adding an alternative drive letter specifically to separate your data from the Windows operating system to address this in the advanced chapters. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and pause and come back when the backup is finished. See you in a bit. So my system image backup is complete. I'm going to go ahead and close the backup tool and then go to my computer. Well, let's take a look at what's on our external drive. You see a directory called Windows Image Backup. So that's the big block of data that backed up my entire C drive and all the contents. All right, I'm going to go ahead and close that. So to restore a saved image after a catastrophic Windows failure, you would use the System Recovery CD or possibly the F8 option, depending on what's available to you. If you're going to use the System Recovery CD, then you'd insert it in your DVD drive and start your PC. Otherwise, if your system will still boot to a certain point, you can hit the F8 option before Windows begins to load, and you'll get the same recovery disk options on the screen. So whichever method you use, you'll eventually get to the System Recovery option screen. Remember to try some of the other options here before moving ahead to the more invasive Image Restore option. If you're confident that you need to replace your entire Windows operating system installation with the system recovery image, then you'd select Windows Complete PC Restore. The next screen will prompt you to find the image backup that you want to use for this recovery. If you have your external hard drive with the image present on it attached to the PC at the time that you run this program, Windows will typically find it and it'll show it in this menu with the radio button next to Restore the following backup selected. If Windows doesn't find your image or you don't see the correct image listed, go ahead and check the radio button next to Restore a different backup and hit Next. Then you'll be presented with a typical browse screen to browse over to your external hard drive and then select the image that you're looking to restore. Then you'll say Finish and the restore will take place. After the recovery is complete, you can restart your PC, remove the DVD from the drive, and see if Windows starts normally. If it does, Remember that this image is older than what you were using before your PC failed, so you may need to reinstall new apps or let Windows Update bring things up to date. Alright, so that's a lot in terms of recovery and several different types that we covered. So here's some final thoughts on the backup types. There are two main categories of recovery that we've talked about. Recovery of your personal data files and recovery of Windows components. You now know that the recovery of your data files is accomplished using the Windows Backup tool while the recovery of core Windows operating system and files is accomplished using the system recovery CD that you created and the tools that it contains. Windows failures can exhibit themselves in many ways. Maybe Windows won't start up, or you get some type of error, or maybe your PC just hangs when you try to start it. Or you could be experiencing very problematic errors in behavior after a new install or big change. Whatever the case, if your PC is running, you should use your antivirus and anti-spyware tools to scan your PC and make sure the problem isn't related to malware. Then resort to the Windows Repair Tool options. So that covers all the main types of recoveries and tools used to bring your PC or data back to working order. We covered a lot of information here and it's likely that you were not able to complete all of the safeguards discussed in one pass. Recovery after failure is one of the most important aspects to maintaining a safe and secure environment. More importantly, once you get these recovery tools and procedures in place, they will bring you great peace of mind knowing that whether you've deleted a single file, whether you've destroyed your entire Windows installation, or even if your PC is stolen, 
You could recover it to a working state that's very similar to what you had before the event and be productive quickly. Many users don't place much importance on backup and recovery, and that's a huge mistake because every single PC on the planet fails eventually or could be stolen. One thing is for sure, once you have something like this happen to you and you end up with a vanilla install of Windows on a new PC or hard drive with none of your settings or tweaks, none of your applications, and more importantly, none of your documents, photographs, banking history, etc., then you'll definitely be reviewing this chapter again and putting these protections in place for the future. So why not do it now and make sure you're covered? That's why we're here, right? Okay, so that concludes Chapter 2 of the Moderate Level for our system. As always, let's go back to our trusty clipboard and review the things that we accomplished. So we reviewed the Windows file system. We created a separate location for personal user files on Drive C. We reviewed the NTFS security concepts. We locked down files using NTFS for our data directories. We reviewed backup and recovery. We covered data file backups and performed our first backup. We created a system repair disk. We reviewed startup repair. We reviewed System Restore, and we reviewed System Image, as well as creating a new system image on our external disk drive. Wow, we covered a lot of ground in this chapter. I know it's impossible to implement all of these recommendations the first time through, so it's very important to take the time to review this chapter and other previous chapters before moving ahead, so that you can make sure that each recommendation is implemented. You may have to go out and purchase the external backup drives, for example and then come back and finish the backup and recovery sections. The concepts and recommendations to this point bring a tremendous amount of additional security and stability to anyone running a Windows PC in a real-world, internet-connected environment. But the only way to make sure that you're as safe as possible is to make sure you follow the recommendations. Just doing a few of what you think are the simpler ones will leave gaps in your plan, which will lead to problems later. Although this seems like a lot of change, it really isn't. Once you adopt these concepts, they become part of your normal routine and it gets much simpler. And once you benefit from them by avoiding a hack, avoiding a failure, or being able to quickly recover, you'll see that these changes are much easier than the alternative. I know I sleep very well at night knowing that the personal and financial information on my systems are safe. Next up is the advanced level chapter. I'll be covering a few improvements on some of the steps we have already taken. For example, we already created a set of directories on Drive C to store your personal data files so they wouldn't be mixed with your Windows program files. But as you've seen here, you're still backing up all of your stuff every time you do a system image or recovery of your Windows files. So in the next chapter, we'll cover how to create a new drive letter for your personal items and all other non-Windows related files so that your Windows operating system area is clean and simple to backup and recover. Then we'll take your file security to the next level with file encryption where we'll use tools to encrypt your personal data file areas so they cannot be viewed by any user ever, even if the PC is stolen. The advanced section is just that, it's more advanced, and the tools that I'll introduce to you will be more demanding on your knowledge of these principles, but they build on what we've already covered. So if you have completed all the chapters up to this point, then you should be ready to go. So I look forward to seeing you at the advanced level.